Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, St. Elmo Wilken is going to talk about interrogating the effect of enzyme kinetics on metabolism using differentiable constraint based models. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of MLDVI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Please know that all materials are licensed under a CC BY 4.0 license, except where further list licenses details are provided. So let's introduce uh, PERMED briefly. PERMED COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. PERMED COE focuses on the simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics into, medi uh, into medical action. The performance of cell simulation software nowadays is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. Permit COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present HPC exascale systems in order to create, in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions of medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize uh, cell level simulation software to run in pre exascale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest, such as drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling for uh, COVID-19 virus and patients tissue. Additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals integrating the permit communities into the European HP6 scale ecosystem and building the basis for the sustainability of permit COE. So let me now introduce our speaker today. St. Elmo Wilken completed, completed his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at the University of Pretoria. His PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara, leverages both computational and wet lab aspects to investigate and understand the metabolism of anaerobic gut fungi. His current postdoc at the University at the Institute of Quantitative and Theoretical Biology at the Heinrich Heine University in Dusseldorf is focused on using quantitative models to elucidate the contribution of metabolism to the stability and composition of microbial consortia. He has partnered with Permit COE researchers, including Dr. Miroslav Kratochvil to develop a way to differentiate constraint-based models to conduct sensitivity analysis efficiently. So, Elmo, the floor is yours. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a technique I developed with uh, some collaborators in Pyramid Curie, including Merrick and another collaborator at the Zusa Institute, Matui. Okay, so essentially the technique is centered around a way to efficiently perform sensitivity analysis of constraint-based models. Uh, but before I get there, I first want to kind of broadly introduce metabolic modeling so that you all get a sense of where uh, constraint-based sensitivity analysis fits into the, the metabolic modeling field. So to do this, I'm going to introduce differential equation-based metabolic models. So this is this uh, these models where the metabolites are the variables. And then I'm going to introduce something called metabolic control analysis, which is just sensitivity analysis of ODE or ordinary, ordinary differential equation-based models. Then we're going to shift gears to constraint-based models, where in constraint-based models, the fluxes are the variables. And this is where the meat of the present presentation is where I'll explain this technique we developed, uh, which really boils down to constraint-based metabolic control analysis. And then the last two bullet points are just some applications of this technique. So uh, metabolic modeling is 
really a field where we try and predict the states uh, of intracellular variables in a cell. So in a classic ordinary differential equation based metabolic model, you're typically interested in modeling the intracellular metabolites of a cell subject to some parameters. So in this very simplified view, we have a cell, okay? And then we've got a flux in of some metabolite, S1, and then some metabolic transformation, which happens with flux V2, and then some transporter that takes it out, or that takes S2 out at rate uh, V3. So these Vs are the fluxes in the system, and these Ss are the metabolites. So if you perform a mass balance on this system, you end up with two differential equations that are coupled through this through their fluxes. So the rate of change of metabolite S1 is just a mass balance around it. So you see you increase it with V1 and you decrease it with V2. So these are the fluxes. And then similarly for the second metabolite. Now you can rewrite this system of differential equations in a matrix form that looks like this, okay? And then you can simplify this even more to get this really short form of the metabolic model that describes the cell you're trying to model. Now, typically for uh, metabolic models that are composed of differential equations, these fluxes, V1, V2, and v V3, are functions of parameters for example, like the turnover number of the enzymes, the actual concentration of the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction, um, and michaelis menten type kinetics usually. So this would be a very simplified form of, for example, this flux V2. So you can imagine then if you have a large system uh, that you're trying to model with many, many reactions and many metabolites, um, this N, the stoichiometric matrix, and the flux vector get really big. And what's really problematic here is this flux, ve this flux vector is composed of many parameters, okay? And a problem we have in biology is that there are really, really many parameters you need to measure, and most of these parameters are really tough to measure. So people can measure them, but there, there's a lot of noise. So for example, these KCATs, the turnover numbers for an enzyme, there's a, there's a database called Brenda that has a collection of many of these uh, turnover numbers, but they're quite variable. So while you can theoretically parameterize a complex ordinary differential equation model like this, there are many parameters. Uh, so an obvious question that that arises then is, okay, I can model my system, I can, I can write the, the differential equation model out, and I can, if I'm lucky, I can get all the parameters, but how sensitive are my predictions to these parameters? So that's really the crux of a uh, sensitivity analysis. Now, the sensitivity analysis for ordinary differential equation uh, based metabolic models has a special name and it's called metabolic control analysis, MCA. Essentially how it works is recognizing that the states of your system, so these intracellular metabolites, right, their solutions depend on the parameters. So these parameters could, for example, be the turnover numbers of the enzymes and, and all, all the constants in your model. So you basically rewrite your differential system of differential equations with this dependence on the parameters explicitly in the system okay and in the simplest case of metabolic control analysis is you assume you reach a steady state so your de derivatives become zero and you essentially try and solve this system so if you were to solve this system you would get a matrix of metabolite concentrations out at the end but what we really want to know is how sensitive are these metabolite concentrations to the parameters. And to do that, we use the implicit function theorem and we implicitly differentiate this equation and we end up with this complicated looking expression. However, to evaluate this is actually particularly easy because at the end of the day, it amounts to solving a linear system of algebraic equations, which is very efficient. Now, there's a lot more theory to metabolic control analysis, but really the gist of it is, if you can solve this system, which is, which is not so tough to do, then you have all the sensitivities. So these are the sensitivities of the system. And just briefly, what a sensitivity means 
is this derivative. It's if I were to change the parameters, how much do my variables change? That's basically what a sensitivity, a sensitivity analysis is. And that is kind of classic metabolic control analysis. And this theory has been around for, for a few decades now. Okay. So, so this can be done. The problem we immediately run into with, with ODE, so differential equation-based models, is just this, this explosion of parameters we need. So you essentially need kinetic rate equations for each reaction in the system. And you can imagine if you try and model a cell at the genome scale, there are just too many interactions to actually take, take into account. So it becomes a really intractable modeling procedure. So what's the way around this? In the differential equation-based system, we have the intracellular metabolites as the variables, but this, this leads to all of these uh, parameters that we need to estimate somehow. So we change gears a little bit and we swap the focus of our model from the metabolites to the fluxes, okay? So let's start again with our very basic model. So a simplified metabolic model, but now we no longer care about the metabolite concentrations, we care about the fluxes. So the first thing we do is we add an extra assumption on the model where we assume we only care about the steady state fluxes of the system. So we can immediately get rid of the, the, the differential terms. And then essentially what we wanna do is we wanna solve this equation. So this is now just the mass balance of the system. But we don't care about the metabolites and the complicated expressions in this flux vector anymore. We just care about the overall fluxes. So I want to know what V1, V2, and V3 is, and I don't care about the concentrations anymore. Okay. So this is relatively easy to solve. The problem is that it is an underdetermined system. So just given this, you can't actually give me a specific value of V1, V2, and V3. All we know is that they're equal to each other at this point. We have to layer on more assumptions to actually uh, perform a meaningful calculation. So how we do this in practice is, uh, con is by converting the entire model into something called a constraint-based model, where flux balance analysis is the most basic implementation of this. So previously we had this very small three flux model. This is a slightly bigger, still a toy model of E. coli's core metabolism. So in this picture, what we see here, these little black dots you see everywhere, these are metabolites, and these colored uh, edges, these are reactions. So that's one reaction, that's a different reaction, another reaction. So by using the same mass balancing procedure as before, we can convert this metabolic map into this steady state equation over here. But we run into the same problem. You can solve this, but it doesn't give you a specific value. We need to do more things to actually get specific values. So what we do is we layer on some physiological bounds on the fluxes, that's here. So this might be directional constraints or even capacity limitations. Additionally, we say, well, we assume that the cell has tuned its regulatory systems to satisfy some objective and a debatable but relatively okay uh, assumption here is that cells have tuned their regulatory systems to grow as quickly as possible. So we can see, we can say or assume that the objective of a cell is to modify its fluxes to grow as quickly as possible. So we need to convert this assumption into a model. And what we do there is we just say that this, this mu, this biomass function, is just a sum of the fluxes that we empirically measure that are correlated to growth. And once we have this empirical uh, function called the biomass function, we can cast everything into an optimization problem, where the optimization problem reads, maximize the growth rate by changing the fluxes, which are the variables, subject to having a mass balance over the system and there being some sort of reasonable bounds on the on the fluxes, so how big the fluxes are allowed to get. Once you do this, this is the kind of fundamental uh, basis of flux balance analysis. And if you solve this optimization problem, you actually get estimates of the intracellular fluxes of a model. So 
I have actually colored the reactions according to their absolute flux in this model as predicted by flux patterns analysis. Now, the really nice thing here is that you require almost no kinetics and really minimal experimental data to get relatively accurate predictions from your model. Now, what's nice is this model is straightforward to implement and it's readily extendable. So the previous model did not incorporate really any kinetic parameters, but that's not uh, really very physiologically realistic because as we know, uh, the flux of a reaction depends on many factors. And one of the most important factors is the concentration of the enzyme catalyzing that reaction. So we can actually incorporate enzyme kinetics into our models relatively easily. So this is the new optimization problem that incorporates enzyme constraints into our model. And just briefly, we still have this biomass objective function. We have two sets of variables, the intracellular fluxes and the intracellular uh, enzyme concentrations. We still have mass balances around the entire system. Now, this is more complicated. We say that the fluxes are bounded by the product of the turnover numbers for each enzyme and the enzyme concentration. Essentially, what this is saying is to catalyze a certain amount of flux, you need uh, an amount of enzyme, and that amount of enzyme depends on how quickly uh, the enzyme can work. So this would be the measured or parameter, the turnover number of the, uh, of the enzyme. Additionally, we can add in a very physiological uh, assumption, and that is that the proteome budget of the cell is bounded. As in a cell can't make an infinite amount of, of enzymes, the actual concentration of enzymes inside of the cell is bounded. So this is really the foundation of enzyme-constrained metabolic models. Um, and we can use this and simulate this and get really realistic predictions. So for example, on in this picture, I show overflow metabolism of E. coli can be modeled with uh, these enzyme constraint models. Essentially what you see here is as you increase the growth rate, so you solve this uh, objective function for different growths, for different growth rates, you have no acetate secretion, but once you hit a critical threshold of, of growth, you actually have acetate secretion. Uh, and this is classic overflow metabolism. And these enzyme constrained metabolic models allow you to predict this kind of behavior from a physiologically realistic basis. So that's really great. We've got these, uh, we've got this relatively complex model. However, we are venturing again into this problematic area where we need lots of parameters. So to make this kind of model work, you need uh, all the turnover numbers for all the enzymes in the system. Fortunately, with uh, the kind of recent developments, there are machine learning uh, techniques to estimate these for unmeasured enzymes. And there's also this aforementioned Brenda database where you can read especially these turnover numbers uh, from for your organism. So that's great. We've got this model and we can get these turnover numbers, but they have the same problems as uh, the ODE type models in that we're not super sure if these turnover numbers are accurate. So we want to ask the same question. How sensitive are the predictions of the model to these turnover numbers? So we want to answer this question. How do we efficiently evaluate the sensitivities? That is, how do we differentiate our model? So find the sensitivity of the fluxes to the turnover numbers or the sensitivity of the enzymes to the turnover numbers. Is there an efficient way to do this? Um, and that's basically the question we answered with this collaborative work. That's the basis of this presentation. So the next two slides are gonna be mathematical in nature, but their whole point is to really make clear this connection point between metabolic control analysis for, for ordinary differential equation-based models and metabolic control analysis for constraint-based models. So very briefly, um, this is a way to write a general quadratic or linear program. So this is a general form of the optimization problem you would solve, for example, 
to do enzyme constrained metabolic flux analysis, okay? Or flux balance analysis also. This is the general form of the FBA type problem. So what we want to do is we want to find, in the enzyme constrained case, we want to find Z, which would be a vector of the fluxes and enzyme concentrations. And we want to differentiate that with respect to the parameters. Now the parameters would then change the actual optimization problems internals. So the question is, how do we do this? Well, we can use some optimization theory, which essentially states that at the optimum, so the optimal solution we find, there are certain uh, conditions called the optimality or KKT conditions that need to hold. And these are summarized here. So essentially we have an equation that is subject to our solution and it's also a function of the parameters. And we can analytically find these expressions. If we just rewrite things neatly, we see that this resembles to almost exactly re resembles that steady state assumption we used for ordinary differential equation based metabolic control analysis, which suggests we can use this exactly the same technique to differentiate our optimization uh, solution with respect to the parameters. So essentially what we do is implicit differentiation again, and we end up with another complicated looking uh, expression. However, this expression is again the sensitivity of our variables with respect to the parameters and this part. Now, with some modern techniques, this is actually very easy to evaluate and efficiently gives us uh, the sensitivities of all the variables in the system to all the parameters by fundamentally just solving a system of linear equations. So once you've solved your optimization problem, to actually get the sensitivity of it is pretty straightforward. And that's really the crux of the work we've done. And if you get this, then that's great because we just are gonna use this technique to do the sensitivity analysis of the entire system. So let's circle back to our model of uh, E. coli's metabolism. So this is no longer a toy model of E. coli's uh, metabolism. This is now a real life model that people use in uh, at the cutting edge of research, as it were. Um, so what we have here is we have glycolysis. This is the, the backbone of the cell. We have the TCA cycle. We have oxidative phosphorylation. So this would be uh, the electron transport chain um, and then some transporters and the PPP pathway. Okay, so we can solve, well, once we have the turnover numbers, which we either get from a database or from um, some machine learning algorithm, once we have a set of parameters, we can plug them into our model and we can solve our model. And what our model gives us at the end is an estimate of the fluxes. So the fluxes now are the colors of the reactions. So brighter color means a higher flux through the associated reaction, but it also gives us an estimate of the intracellular enzyme concentrations that are required. And here I've weighted the kind of the, the width of the reaction in, in, the, in, this, in this figure is, a, is proportional to the amount of enzyme required to catalyze the reaction. So what's interesting here is we can see that there's a glycolysis is obviously a high flux uh, backbone in the system. So it's, it's uh, well, it has high flux, but we see here that the cytochrome oxidase and the ATP synthase, these have the highest flux in, the, in this model that I'm showing but they also require the most enzyme. So this makes, should make intuitive sense because these are really the ATP generating machines of the cell. So the cell needs ATP or energy to grow. So the more you have, uh, so you want to really divert resources into this energy generating machine, machinery in the cell. And this really makes sense from a, from a modeling perspective. And we get all of this from these enzyme constrained models. But now, we have the predictions and we have the machinery to actually estimate the sensitivity of these predictions to, uh, to the parameters. So this is what sensitivity analysis would look like. On the x-axis here, we have the turnover numbers. So these are the parameters associated with each reaction. So each reaction gets one turnover number. And then on the y-axis here, you've got the actual flux variables. 
In the next figure I'll show, I'll show you the enzyme variables. But for now, let's focus on the flux variables. Okay. So in this system, let's first look at this uh, flux, the ATP maintenance reaction in the cell. You can see that it has zero sensitivity to any of the parameters. Now the ATP maintenance reaction is an empirical reaction you add into a model really to, to model maintenance requirements in a cell, okay? So things that, for example, fix cell, fix the uh, processes that fix the cell membrane or uh, prevent protein degradation, kind of constant costs in the model. And that really is just an ATP sink in the model. If you want to grow as quickly as possible, you need to really devote as little energy as possible to this maintenance reaction and divert all your resources into biosynthesis reactions. And that's what we see here, is that the optimal solution will, will devote only the minimum amount of ATP flux to this ATP maintenance reaction, but it doesn't matter what, how you change the turnover numbers of any of the reactions in the cell, you will never get more flux into this maintenance reaction just because it is a growth sink. Okay, so that's basically how we read this. If we were to change any of these turnover numbers, how would the reactions here change? And we can see that for the ATP maintenance reaction, there's zero sensitivity, just nothing would change. And that makes total sense from a modeling perspective. Now let's go back and let's talk about this ATP synthase as an example. So remember this was the very high flux reaction in the model. What we see here, is if you were to increase the turnover number for the ATP synthase, then you would increase the flux for just about every reaction in the model. And this makes sense because if, you, if your ATP synthase is faster, meaning it's more efficient, that means you can grow faster, which means you can channel more flux through your entire metabolism. And hence the sensitivity here is a large positive number. That's really what this means. Likewise, for the cytochrome oxidase turnover number, if you increase the uh, catalytic efficiency of the cytochrome oxidase, you also increase the flux through every single reaction. And that's why you get these large positive uh, sensitivity coefficients. So what's really nice about the sensitivity analysis is you can immediately identify uh, enzymes or, or parameters that have a large control over the fluxes in your solution. And uh, that's immediately a useful thing because it gives you a, a quick view of where you can devote engineering attention and time if you need to. But that's only half the picture. The other half of the picture is are the other variables in the system. The other variables would be these, these genes. So these are actually gene products. So uh, basically the enzymes in the cell. So again, we've got the variables, the outputs of the model, okay? So the gene products, the concentration, and then we have the, the parameters, which will be the turnover numbers again. But now notice that we've got both positive and negative sensitivities. So what does that mean? Let's look at ATP synthase again. If I were to increase the, the uh, turnover number for ATP synthase, for all of these uh, gene products, the model predicts that their concentration would increase because we've got a positive sensitivity. But for this set of gene products, I predict that their concentration will decrease. Now, these gene products actually correspond to the gene products that make up the ATP synthase uh, enzyme. So the ATP synthase is a multi-subunit enzyme. So basically what this is saying is if the turnover number for this enzyme is faster, I will have less of this enzyme, but more of the other enzymes. Now, what's really nice about this is this also makes intuitive sense because what you have at the end of the day then is you need to devote less, less enzyme or relatively less enzyme to this reaction and you can because it's already faster and you can distribute this excess enzyme to all the other enzymes in your system or the excess capacity rather to all the other enzymes in the system and that makes you grow faster. So this is another view into the sensitivity of the, uh, of the of your predictions that you kind of get for free in a way by using this technique we developed. So 
So those were so far the, uh, I would say, the, the entry level analysis techniques you could use uh, to get a sensitivity analysis uh, of your enzyme constraint model. Now, uh, I mentioned before that these enzyme constraint models are really a function of the turnover numbers. So you need to get these turnover numbers from somewhere. And I mentioned that you can use the Brenda database, for example, or recently there have been at least two papers published where people uh, use various machine learning techniques to actually estimate turnover numbers given some molecular information. However, the big question remains, suppose I use these techniques, some technique to estimate turnover numbers. I can get the sensitivities, but what I really care about is how good are these or how accurate are these turnover numbers, especially in the context of my model? If I use these turnover numbers and my model makes predictions, how far away are my predictions from reality? And that's basically uh, what you can ask here with another optimization problem. So let's assume that you have some proteomic data, so this E hat, and you have some in vivo flux measurements data for example, from COVID-13 uh, tracer experiments called VHAT. So these are your experimentally measured data. And let's assume they're available. So now let's also assume that you somehow get your hands on a set of enzyme turnover numbers and you plug this into your model. So here's a mass balance. This is basically the model we had before. The question this optimization problem is asking is at best, how good is my prediction? So if I were to use this model to predict V and E, and I compare them on a relative uh, basis, so this is the mean squared relative error, if I compare them on a relative basis to my observations, how good is this prediction uh, at best? This would be the, this loss function, okay? So this would, for, for example, give you some number. So we can easily solve this optimization problem and that gives us a loss or in a way the accuracy that our model uh, predicts relative to experimental data. But because we have this ability to differentiate optimization problems, we can actually do perform gradient descent. We can, well, we have experimental data. We have an initial set of turnover number estimates. We plug it into this optimization problem we get an estimate of the loss. Then we say, what is the optimal way to adjust my KCAT estimates so that I reduce my loss? And this is really the, uh, the, the basis of a gradient descent technique that can be used to actually fit your parameters to data using your model. So this is a model-based fit. So we can actually do this because we have the necessary data for E. coli. So we have this, this large data set and we have a nice model and we have the, uh, in this case, in the paper, we use uh, machine learning based estimates of the turnover numbers, but we can actually then perform gradient descent to improve the turnover numbers to minimize the loss. So our mean squared relative error. And that's what I show in this figure. So this is the mean squared relative error and at iteration zero, zero or one, rather, uh, we have uh, some sort of loss function. The loss is at some value, okay? Every line here is a data set. So we have our initial loss, then we perform gradient descent, and we actually change the turnover numbers over iterations of gradient descent to minimize the loss. And that's what we're showing here. So we can successfully differentiate our model to reduce the loss. And we can do this over all available data sets. And each data set is uh, a line here. And I've highlighted one of the data sets uh, just for visual purposes. Okay. Um, so we can use gradient descent. And for this highlighted uh, data set, we can actually see how the turnover numbers change. Okay. So these are glycolysis enzymes. So this is how, this is how the turnover numbers change subject to the derivatives that actually then use to update the turnover numbers. The, the really the big takeaway here is we can successfully reduce the mean squared relative error of our model predictions relative to experimental observations. And that's really nice because at the end of the day, we find that we can actually improve our model predictions by approximately 35% on average. And that's what I try and illustrate here. 
So the way this data set worked is we had uh, the proteomic and fluxomic data for wild type E. coli and four knockout conditions. What we do here is we do a, a, a holdout validation set. So we can evaluate the loss relative to the wild type data set by only using training data of these knockouts. And then we get, we get about a 35% improvement in our model predictions. And likewise, for each knockout, we don't use this data to train on, to do the gradient descent on. We use all the other data sets, and then we compare against this, this data we held out. And we find that on average, we improve prediction in a mean squared relative error of sense by about 35%, which is pretty good, actually. Um, as a sanity check, at the end of the day, we can compare our improved turnover numbers to the Brenda measurements for these enzymes. And what we see here is that so this is a sanity check, and all I really want to show you is that we don't get crazy predictions. So it would have been crazy predictions if the model predicted that, or if this turnover, um, sorry, if this gradient descent technique essentially made all the turnover numbers as high as possible. That would indicate that something went wrong. But what we see here is that all the enzyme numbers are changed uh, appropriately and not in a physiologically unreasonable way across various modules. Uh, so these are the turnover number estimates for different enzymes in different metabolic modules. But what we get here is that we don't get like a crazy change. This is uh, a sanity check, essentially, that says that we, what we did here is should give you better turnover numbers. Okay. And that's essentially it. Uh, the, the summary here is that we have uh, developed a way to differentiate constraint-based metabolic models. The technique is computationally efficient. The foundation is very similar to metabolic control analysis. We're actually working on a package to, to simplify this so that you can basically uh, use another package we made for constraint-based modeling and immediately differentiate um, the models from this package. Um, and by doing this, you really unlock a lot of differentiable, uh, differentiability enabled techniques to do, for example, sensitivity analysis or parameter estimation. So I'd like to thank my collaborators and I'll take any questions if anyone has anything. Thank you, Elmo. Thank you very much for that nice presentation. Uh, so we have a couple of questions already. Uh, remember, you can use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel to ask oh, questions. Yeah. So the first question is, how does the loss function for evaluating a KCAT set work with flux variability? Okay, so this is something I brushed over. Uh, let me go back here. Yeah, so, okay, so remember, when I started talking about uh, the, de well, uh, the degeneracy here, we have this, uh, this system of equations and you need to add extra assumptions onto it uh, because there are no unique solutions here. In the case where you do add extra assumptions on here, you still don't actually have a unique solution. Uh, there is still some variability here. And that's, I think, essentially what the question is well, the foundation of the question is there is still in here in this the normal FBA, but also in its enzyme constrained variant, there is still uh, flux variability. And what does that mean? That means that these fluxes and enzyme concentrations are not unique. So this presents a problem for differentiating a model because the theory at the end of the day says you can't differentiate a degenerate solution. The model or the solution you, you differentiate needs to be unique. Otherwise, uh, you essentially have a singular a singularity problem over here. You can't invert this matrix. So uh, to fix that, um, you need a unique solution when you differentiate that. And this is a QP, so in this case, you actually do get a unique solution because it's a quadratic program. So here the differentiability is not, is not an issue. 
However, when you do the sensitivity analysis, so in this part, you do actually run into differentiability issues. And the way to fix this is to actually only focus on the active solution of your model, uh, because that then is unique. So you ignore the, the, the zero fluxes, as, as it were, and then you can differentiate it. Uh, let's look at the question. Okay, okay thanks. Then there's the next question. Is it a problem that the gradient descent algorithm may get stuck in local minima? Did you check for alternative solutions? Yes. So definitely that is a problem. And we actually did that by the classic way of just starting at different initial, when I say initial conditions here, I just mean different initial uh, parameter initializations. Um, and kind of a side uh, result out of this were that, so this would be the gradient descent over iterations again, but now we use different initial conditions. So this blue line would be the initial conditions using the machine learning estimates. And these red lines uh, would be if you picked random turnover numbers to begin with. Uh, and what you can see here is that the machine learning estimates are actually not so terrible. They do end up at better solutions typically than random starting points. But you would do what you typically do in machine learning is you would just try out many different initial conditions. And when I say initial conditions, I mean the initial parameter estimates and then go from there. Uh, is that okay? Yes. What's the next one? Okay, so next question. How do the sensitivities calculated with CMCA differ from the reduced cost and shadow prices from the LP optimal solution? Uh, so the reduced costs, if I remember correctly, would be essentially what happens if you change if, if this is zero, for example, here is allowed to vary. So they're not actually asking the same thing. Uh, the, the sensitivity here, the old school, I would say in quotation marks, way to calculate the sensitivity here. So, so the correct analog here would be you, for example, simulate your system, okay? And then you perturb the turnover number by a infinitesimal amount and you re-simulate the system and you essentially do a finite difference approximation. That's the sensitivity we're much more efficiently calculating here. Uh, essentially here, we are skipping, uh, if you have n parameters, we're skipping n optimization evaluations uh, to get the sensitivities. Okay. Then there's another question. Nice work. Can you incorporate long longitudinal data measurements from different time points or the method, method only fits steady state data? Um, okay, so this is problematic because if you want to have a dynamic sim simulation, that makes things a lot more complicated because you typically have to do uh, like dynamic flux balance analysis if you have a time course and the differentiability there is unexplored, shall we say. Uh, in principle, you could use the same technique, um, but I think it'll be a lot more complicated uh, because you'd have to somehow unroll all the sensitivities over your, your ODE you solve at the end to get the uh, overall change you have to do. Um, so the short answer is in principle you can, but it would be tough. Uh, uh, future work as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay, we still have some time for, for more questions from the audience. Uh, in the meanwhile, oh, there's one more coming in. Uh, what is the computational cost if the GPU accelerated? Can you analyze large multimodels? So the major cost with this is solving the optimization problem uh, because for every iteration here, you have to solve, in this case, you have to solve a QP, okay? Uh, so that's the major cost. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of really any optimization solver that gets a dramatic speed up from GPU acceleration, for example. A lot of these things are serial. So you could definitely do this part where you try different initial points in parallel, but at the end of the day, 
each iteration is going to be a serial situation where I don't think GPUs are going to help that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, while we wait for next other questions, I just wanted to share my screen for a second. Elmo, if you can yeah. stop yours. Go. Okay. Just uh, uh, to remind remember remind everyone of the upcoming sessions of the webinars that we have in the 9th of March on uh, supercomputer based modeling and simulation for advanced biomedical applications, as well as on the 23rd of March for development uh, of a virtual rheumatoid arthritis synovial fibroblast for large scale dynamic analysis. So you can sign up in the Permit COE website, as always, where you can also find the recordings of the previous sessions. And also, uh, as we have been announced in the last sessions, in the last webinars, the applications for the Permit Series Summer School uh, are closing on the 6th of March. So for those who are interested in getting hands-on experience, this will be a one-week course taking place in Barcelona. You can uh, sign up also on our website. So uh, yeah, any more questions from any participants? I was going to ask, but I think it's more or less the, the same question we, we got in, in the end about what were the like yeah the, the, the main limitations of this methodology, like uh, I guess in terms of resources, that's that's at the moment it's not like super general accessible to, to, to everyone, right? In terms of methodology. Um, I would actually say the, the biggest problem for this would be the experimental data sets. And then you also need a high quality model. And those are in short supply. Essentially, these enzyme constraint models hinge on the turnover numbers, which there are ways to get that, to get the data you need. But the problem is a lot of these reactions have stoichiometry associated with their uh, enzymes. So they've got multi subunit uh, enzymes. And almost no models take that into account, and the data are pretty sparse to get that. So it's it's more a modeling problem. The application is pretty straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Then uh, I see no more questions. So thank you everyone for, for attending the session. Thank you, Elmo, very much for this uh, really great presentation. And see you everyone uh, in the next session. Bye-bye.